Uh, tonight's lesson, I'd, I'd like to, uh, to look at, first of all, start out with Mark chapter 10 and verse 13. Mark chapter 10 and verse 13. In that particular passage, uh, Jesus is uh, doing something that is, it was very, very important to the Jewish people. And the Bible says in verse 13 of Mark 10 that, that they brought little children to him. And one of the things that I think we, we probably may not have a, a full understanding of to a great extent is what was called the Jewish blessing. The Jewish blessing consisted of five different items and just to kind of take those and, and put them all together and lump them into like two or three different things, uh, what would happen with a little child is, uh, first of all, they, the child would, would be touched. And, you know, we live in a society today where the little children, you know, we're just very much aware, unless we or their parents, you don't touch little children very much at all because uh, we just don't do that. There's just too many things, that problems in our society, and uh, that a lot of trouble can happen from all of that. School teachers are very much aware of that. And we miss out on a lot because of that. Children do because they, they need to be touched. They need to be held in, in the right way. And so that's one of the things that happened with a Jewish blessing, a child would be touched. <clears throat> and then also there would be a, uh, a bright promise of that child's future that would be given. You know, here's some good things we expect from you. We believe all these blessings will happen to you. And then there also would be a guarantee that uh, certain adults, protectors, would be there to try to bless them and help them as they go through their journeys of life. And so that type of thing may have been what Jesus was doing as he was blessing the children. And in particular, a child's first birthday that was real important. And so it may have been very, very little children that Jesus was cradling in his arms. And then you've got these apostles that are standing around. And of course, they, they think that's a foolish thing to imagine that he's taking time out to do a thing along that line. But it wasn't at all. And they began to uh, rebuke some of the people and say, you know, leave him alone. He's too busy to be doing this. And then he sort of straightens them out and says, you know, let the little children come to me. And he, he loves the children. He says, don't forbid them of such as the kingdom of God. Assuredly, I say to you, whoever does not receive the kingdom of God as a little child will by no means enter it. And so Jesus, as the song says, he loves the little children, <laughs> all the children of the world. And you think about this, this is Jesus as he's getting ready to go to the cross. He's going to be dying there. And yet, he wants to take time to, uh, to show his love and his affection toward those children. And in fact, it's just kind of hard for us to really warm up to somebody who doesn't like children. And you can't imagine uh, Jesus, you know, without him liking children, can you? It just seems like something that will just be a natural thing for our Savior, that he would love children. <coughs> Jesus not only loved children, but he also was uh, certainly willing to use them in illustrations. And so in Matthew chapter 18, uh, verse uh, 1, at that time the disciples came to Jesus and they asked a question, who is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? Well, that sounds like something a, a person on a football team might want to know. Am I the best player on this team? Or am I the number one employee in this company? Or something along that line. Well, who's the greatest? We want to know who the greatest is. And that was a, the same kind of spirit that James and John's mom had, Mrs. Zebedee, as she approached Jesus, and she wanted to know if her boys could sit on the right and left hand of Jesus when he came into his kingdom. And, of course, they were thinking in terms of materialistic kingdoms, certainly. But who's the greatest? Well, Jesus, very patient as a teacher, uh, he calls a little child. I can just see him doing this. He looks over here, maybe he sees a lady and says, Ma'am, uh, could you bring your little child over here to me just for a minute? And so he has a little child there, and he sets the child down. And he says, and lie, surely, I say to you, unless you are converted and become as little children, you will by no means enter the kingdom of heaven. Whoever humbles himself as this little child is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. And he moves into another line of teaching very, very beautifully in such a wise way and talking about people who are young in the faith and things along that line. But right here at this point, he's still talking just about a child, a little child. And so there's something then about children that Jesus wants to use to illustrate to us some important things for our life. And we need to learn from it. Jesus used all kinds of illustrations from shepherding to the sheep uh, to 
the ideas about uh, lilies of the field and the different uh, animals and things along that line. It, it, he was very, very quick to use different sorts of illustrations people could identify with. And so certainly he, he was real happy to use an illustration of children. So there's something about children then that we need to do to try to imitate that in our own life is what he's stressing. And in fact, he said it's so important you can't go to heaven without it. So I was thinking this evening we could look at some things about children that are just precious and make sure that we take those same things and we apply them to our life every day as we are trying to be pleasing in God's sight. The first thing we notice, and he said in verse 4, you need to humble yourself. So uh, little children typically are humble. Now you have some that are exhibitionist. You run into that every once in a while. They just want to be on center stage, and, and I don't know how many children out of 100 that would ever be. But most children seem to be willing to kind of stay in the background, and they really would rather not call attention to themselves that much. And so as a result, now, you know, we don't think of, of children, uh, you know, usually involved in, in kind of uh, up, uproars and problems and trying to be center stage and things along that line. Uh, they usually, if, if they have uh, some occasion that brings them in front of people, uh, they're probably embarrassed. I'm willing to say that the little child that Jesus uses as an illustration may have been embarrassed to be brought out and people staring at him. I didn't, I didn't want people staring at me. And, you know, I can remember as a little boy sometimes being brought in front of a classroom, and it was just a frightening situation to me. And you may remember that when you were little, something like that happening. And so just to, just don't want to be in the limelight. I'd rather be just kind of off somewhere to myself or uh, with my friends, but, but I don't have to be number one. I don't have to be any kind of a place where, you know, I'm looked upon as being special in some way. That really works well with Christianity, doesn't it? To have that kind of attitude, an attitude of humility, uh, not being overwhelmed with pride or place or prestige in any way, uh, not yet discovering just how important you are, uh, maybe more important than others, better than others. And so children make a great il illustration along that line. Pride is a destructive force. And in the Word of God, you see it exhibited many times in Genesis 3, Eve, one of the things that caused her to fall into that temptation of partaking of the forbidden fruit was not only that it was good to look upon and that it also it was something that would be enjoyable to eat, but it was also something that was desired to make one wise. So maybe I could be a little smarter, maybe smarter than Adam, but I'd be a little bit smarter. I could be maybe a little bit better, and I want that. Nothing wrong with just a regular form of pride in one sense, but, but a sinful pride, especially sinful in that situation that goes against God's will, was what she had on that occasion. Well, throughout the Bible you see it exhibited in 2 Samuel 24. David was looking at his army, how many people he has. And, and so you look around at a vast array of soldiers, and I could see how it could be a temptation to say, I wonder just how many soldiers I've got if I were to count them all up. Well, he did. And you wouldn't believe it. When he tallied up the total, 1,300,000 soldiers. Now, that's more than what most armies here on earth today would be able to amass. Wouldn't that fill you with pride? Well, it did. And so following that, uh, he realizes he has made a terrible mistake. Because by looking at his armies, he probably naturally assumed that means that I would probably have the ability on my own as being a commander over all this group to do about anything I want to. You mean even without God? What well, I wouldn't say that, but maybe, maybe anything I want to. And so the next thing he knows, Gad is visiting with him. I wonder if David got a little bit gun shy when preachers came and knocked on his door. <laughs> you know, Nathan did, and we know what he talked about, the ewe lamb illustration. Then Gad appears and says, uh, you know, you're going to have one of three punishments. You can choose which one you want. And <clears throat> though they were horrifying in nature, a famine, being chased by your enemies, or pestilence. And so the pestilence is what befell him. 70,000 of his soldiers died uh, from Dan to Beersheba. And then following that, he goes out and he, he offers a sacrifice at the home of Aruna the Jebusite, you might recall. He does that in 2 Samuel 24. 
uh, that whole thing happens, and, and the blood of 70,000 men are on his hands because of what he did with his pride. In 2 Kings chapter 5, we read of a man named Naaman who was almost equivalent probably to a four-star general and a great soldier, powerful, powerful man, had leprosy. And we remember that that leprosy could be cured as he would dip in the River Jordan for seven times. And so uh, he, when confronted with that by the servant, says, you know, I, I, I don't want to do that. And what about, we have other rivers that are a lot better, uh, like the Abana or the Farpar, uh, those rivers along that line, you know, that's, that's where I would rather go. If you're going to be put in water seven times, what difference does it make anyway? Probably it's what he was reasoning. Pride. He had pride. And so his servant rebuked him and said, you know, if you'd been told to do something really big, you'd have been glad to. Now here you are told to just dip seven times, so do it. Why don't you do that? And, and he did. He fortunately didn't let his pride overwhelm him in that way. Nebuchadnezzar filled up with pride. And just the kind of man that uh, wanted to have a huge image constructed of him. He ends up having a horrifying disease befalling him, a form of what was called lycanthropy or boanthropy, where he took upon himself the form like of animals even and was just uh, like a wild animal for a period of time and humbled. And then he extolled and praised Almighty God following that. Others didn't get a chance to praise God following their humility or their pride, uh, such as Herod, for example, in Acts 12, who delivered an oration and the people said it was like the voice of a god. And instead of uh, just falling down right then and saying, Oh, please, no, don't associate me with God. And instead, he didn't give glory to God, and he was eaten with worms because of his pride. Pride is mentioned 49 times in your Bible, not one time in a positive way. In Proverbs 8, 13, the fear of the Lord is to hate evils, pride and arrogancy, and the evil way, and the forward or perverse mouth, God says, I hate. Proverbs 11, 2, when pride comes, well, then shame comes too. In Proverbs 13, 10, only by pride comes contention. But with little children, humble. A little child of a, of a senator could play with a little child of a garbage collector, and there would never be any problems whatsoever. Nothing would ever be brought up concerning that. But when people get to be big boys and girls, <laughs> it makes a big difference sometimes, doesn't it? And we think about pride. What do we have to be proud about? Uh, anything we ever accomplish, uh, intellectually, worldly, wealth, uh, money, whatever it might be, has been given to us as a gift, either directly or indirectly from Almighty God. Uh, not one positive promise is made to those who are proud. God resists the proud, but gives grace to the humble. So that's one thing about children, I think, that must have Jesus wanted to uh, stress to us. A second thing about children, though, is the fact you can, you can teach them. They are teachable. I know that when people get into their adult years, especially when they get advanced in their adult years, it's harder to learn things. But little children can just pick up things. Well, they pick up things rapidly, don't they? It's amazing what children can learn in such a short period of time. They're smart, aren't they? They really are. And they are teachable. And usually they are anxious to learn. Talk about people getting older and resisting learning. You know the story real well, don't you? In Acts 7, when Stephen is preaching, and he pointed out that those Pharisees resisted the Holy Spirit. Now, they didn't want to hear. And what did they do? Just to illustrate that what he was saying was correct, they put their fingers in their ears. Like, you're right, we don't want to listen anymore to you. We don't want to hear a thing you've got to say. When Jesus said, before Abraham was, I am, John 8, 58, same thing. They're ready just to stone him immediately, take his life, don't want to listen. Don't confuse me with facts. I don't want to learn anything. So in the Word of God, over and over again, the blessed Holy Spirit offers invitations to us to listen, to choose, Joshua 24, 15. He that hath an ear to hear, let him hear, says Jesus, Revelation 2, 11. The beautiful invitation of the Holy Spirit, and in the Revelation 22, verse 17, the Spirit and the bride, or the church, say, come. Let him that heareth say, come. Just over and over there are invitations for us to learn. 
Jesus said in Matthew 11, Come unto me, all you that labor and are heavy laden, and I'll give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me. Be a disciple of mine. It's so important that that word disciple even appears in your Bible frequently. A learner. I want to be a learner. I want to be taught the Word of God. I can't be a true Christian without that. The disciples were first called Christians at Antioch, Acts chapter 11, verse 26. Is there a connection between those two words? I think so. I believe they were called Christians because they were disciples, and they were disciples, and thus because of that they became Christians. They were learners, and learners caused them to become Christians. And so we look in Acts 17, 11, where the Bereans were more noble than those in Thessalonica. They searched those scriptures daily, whether the things were so. We study, we learn. There's so much found inside of a wealth of material that's been written by brothers in Christ, sometimes sisters in Christ. We have some excellent material that we're using on Tuesday morning, and some sisters in Christ have written a lot of that, and I've been blessed by that. And so we can learn, and we continually learn as we live the Christian life. We want to be teachable, just like those children are teachable. When we hear God's Word preached, when we pursue it thoughtfully and prayerfully, the light is brightened and increased as we consider the entrance of God's Word into our hearts, into our lives. I think the providence of God is a great teacher. When you look at all the ways God has blessed us, Romans 8, 28, we know that all things work together for good to them who love God, those who are the called according to His purpose. What a great teacher God's providence is for us. Children are teachable. Children also are trusting. For the most part, they trust authority figures. It's always a frightening thing when you see a young person directly rebel against the authority of an adult, isn't it? It shocks us. Uh, we can't really believe that it actually happened. Did I actually hear that boy say that to me? Or that young girl say what she said to me? Because it's such a normal thing for children to be obedient to authority. I'm thinking right now some of our young people here, and on one again, I won't call any of these young people's names out to embarrass them, but I was talking to some adults one night, and this precious young girl standing right here, just patiently, didn't say a word, did not try to intrude, and then finally, when I got through talking to the adults, then she said, Mr. Mike, and then she started talking to me. I thought, now that's, that's the way Young people ought to be right there. That's just a great example, isn't it, of how young people should be. Uh, they trust an authority. They look at others who are older than them, and they are willing to, to believe in them and accept what is said. And I know we look at children, and, and the children with their parents, and children believe in their parents. They believe that their parents will teach them right and will lead them in the right pathway. It's a shame sometimes, as we get older, but we don't, we don't believe in that as much, right? From a teacher's viewpoint, I can remember well one of our in-services where uh, somebody told us, and they'd done enough research on all this, that they said from like uh, pre-K and kindergarten all the way up through about the fourth grade, teacher is like number one. You know, whatever teacher says, that's, that's what goes. You know, that's got to be right. And I can sit down right now and bore you to death by telling you every one of my teachers all the way from, I didn't go to kindergarten, I wasn't smart enough, so they went ahead and put me in first grade. Nobody wanted me in kindergarten. But first grade all the way through the sixth grade, I can tell you every one of those teachers. I'm willing to say probably all of you could too, your teachers, because those people had an impact on you. And you trusted what they said. If my first grade teacher told me that the sun was going to rise at a certain time tomorrow morning, I would believe in that because I believed in that person's authority. And so when we think about that, we realize that there can be a time when, when certainly that, that, that can fail. We understand that. I, mean, I want my children to trust in me and my wife right now. I'd like for them to do that, but not a blind trust. And they need to investigate things on their own. We realize that. But for us as children, we should be trusting because we know our Father will never lead us wrong. He'll always guide us in the right way. And that reminds us of the faithful old verse we look at a lot, Jeremiah 10, 23. O Lord, the way of man is not in himself. It is not in man that walketh to direct his own steps. Back a few weeks ago, I uh, had an opportunity to go uh, hiking and camping. So we, we hiked seven and a half miles back in 
to the Appalachian Trail from the entrance in Springer Mountain, Georgia. And so uh, Brandon, our oldest, uh, he got up about four in the morning and he said he was sick and we needed to try to get back out of there. And I said, can you hike us back out of here? He said, I can do it, no problem at all. Well, we all had our little uh, flashlights on our head and he took us right out of there. Now I'll tell you a little thing about the Appalachian Trail because I can't tell you much about it, but I can tell you this. As you go along, every so often, you'll see a white mark, a slash mark. That's the symbol of the Appalachian Trail. You always know you're doing right when you see that. And so you follow those white marks as you go along, and you stay on that path, and even though it just seems like there's no way this is ever going to lead me back to my car, it does. And it did. And I'm thankful for that, because it was rather cold that morning. Well, more important than that, when we walk along the pathway in our Christian life, I know that God will get us from here to heaven. But there are times when it may not seem like it. There's times when the path may seem serpentine in nature, and I don't know if I'm still walking the right path as far as what I can tell. But you look at your Bible, and you follow your Bible, and you follow that path, and one day, we're going to be with God eternally in heaven. We don't follow the path. We have no choice, no hope. But that involves trust. There are many subjects in the Bible that are more difficult for us maybe as human beings to just believe in as easily. I don't like the subject of hell. I don't like preaching on it, but I believe in it. I believe it because I trust in God. I don't enjoy a lot of subjects that could cause any kind of pain to people in certain situations, but I trust in God, no matter come what may, we believe in Him. Like children, we trust in their Father. I don't understand a lot of things. I don't understand about uh, loved ones that pass away. Now, I, I mean, I, I can go through the mechanics of Eve's sin and Adam's sin, and there's death, and God said there would be death. We know that, we understand that, but as far as being able to understand and, and comprehend it and deal with it and, uh, and move forward, it's a hard thing to do. So it comes back down to trusting in God. We know that God will do us right. And then I love another thing about children, and I believe this must have been something Jesus had in mind, that they have a short memory. And I'm not recall meaning by that, that what you teach a child on Monday, they can't recall on Tuesday when it's test time. I mean that they can forgive real quickly. Uh, we probably, most of us, could relate to our childhood. And you have your best friends. And well, my best friend was a fellow named James Burchett. And so James and I sometimes would get in the most horrible fights. My mom would call them tear down drag outs. And so when we get in those fights, we'd tell each other, I, I, I hate you. You're the worst friend I've ever had. I hope I never see you again. As far as I'm concerned, you ought to just drop dead. I mean, just things like that. Fifteen minutes later, we're back up in an apple tree eating apples together, talking about where we're going to camp out tonight. Why? I needed James. He's my friend. You can't lose your friend. Not just over a fight. And then two days later, I couldn't even tell you what the fight was about. And, uh, you know, he'd win sometimes, I'd win sometimes. You know, I, who knew what was going to happen? But one thing that was important was I had to have my friend. I needed him. And as Christians today, we sure do need each other. Life is too short, isn't it? Eternity is too real for me to hold any kind of grudges against somebody in any way. 1 Corinthians 13, 5, thinketh no evil, which means that I don't store up into an account or a ledger what anyone has ever done to hurt me. I love everybody. Taking home, taking Miss Ruth home. Can you hear me all right, Miss Ruth? taking Miss Ruth home the other night, and Ruth looked at me and she said, Mike, as far as I know, I love everybody. And as far as I know, everybody loves me. And I said, Miss Ruth, I believe that's right. And, you know, isn't that great to be able to say that? That I love everybody, and everybody loves me. And that's kind of what we have. We have that here in this family. Everybody loves each other. It's not the biggest congregation in the world, but this is a fine congregation. And we're thankful for what we have here. God's blessed us so much. And so, and I, I don't know of anybody who has any problem with anybody. But I know this, that as we go through bumps that we have and bruises of life, sometimes it does happen. And we want to be like little children in that way. 
And I don't believe we can get to heaven without those four things, do you? We have to be humble. We have to be teachable, trusting, and then we have to be able to forgive, which is what that short memory is all about. And so Jesus said to be like little children. We're thankful that we can be children of God and call him our Father, and we praise our Father in heaven for being able to have him and that wonderful relationship that we have. Do you have that this evening? If you're not a Christian, we want you to be a part of the family too. It's wonderful to be a part of the family of God. We're not better than anybody else. We're just the family of God, and we love you. And uh, we love the Lord, and we want to serve him. And to obey the gospel, I can't tell you on my own because I don't have any power to do that. So we rely on our Jesus, and our Jesus teaches us about how we need to believe in him and be willing to repent of our sins, as we talked about this morning to confess that he is the Son of God and then be immersed in Christ, buried with water in baptism, raised to walk in newness of life, 2 Corinthians 5 and verse 17. If you've not done that, you're an accountable person. Uh, we would invite you to come to Jesus. And if you've done that and you look at your life and you feel you've not been pleasing in God's sight, certainly with all the love in our heart, we invite you to come back to the Lord. If you need to respond to his invitation, we invite you to come to him now as we stand and as we sing together.